control? <laughs> okay, I'll go over here. You ever feel like life is just out of control? I'm not talking about some wild crap. I'm just talking about in your mind and just things you're just, we're busy and we don't know why we're so busy. It's just out of control. But see, a lot of us, is, or this is why I think God prepared us for this word out of the book of Acts today. This is where, this, this is, is a reflection of most of us in the room. People watching by video. The Bible says in Acts 24, but when Felix heard these things, having more accurate knowledge of the way, he adjourned the proceedings and said, when Lysus, the commander, or Lysus, the commander comes down, I will make a decision on your case. So he commanded the centurion to keep Paul and let him have liberty and told him not to forbid any of his friends to provide for, for him or visit him. And after some days, Felix came with his wife Drusilla who was Jewish he sent for Paul and heard him concerning the faith in Christ now as he reasoned about righteousness self control and the judgment to come Felix was afraid and your Bible says that Felix answered this way go away <laughs> go away for now when I have a more convenient time I will call for you. What you just experienced was the most convenient time in your life. And a half a dozen or, or so said, I'm going to go for it. I'm not saying you didn't get touched out there at some point. But this is the reality of where we live today is we're looking for something more convenient. Something easier. We, we could preach on the sin of Jeroboam. We could do that. We could talk about making it easier for you. Replacing prayer with what? Replacing fasting with what? Replacing prayer, praise, and worship with what? What do we want to replace it with? It's not convenient. Sometimes church is not convenient. How many of you in here, how many in this room like it when someone can't make their mind up? And all the husbands and wives say amen. It's the most challenging thing. You know one of the most challenging things in the world after a Holy Ghost filled service like this is talking to your wife about where you're going to eat. You know why y'all are laughing? Because every one of y'all do it. And the first response is, where do you want to go? The response is, I don't know or I don't care. And then you mention a whole list of stuff. Now, I don't really want Mexican food. Well, you said you didn't care. Well, what about the Highlander? No, I'm not in the mood for Highlander, really. You know what I do? Pull into the H-E-B. Get a package of Black Forest ham, and we're having ham sandwiches. <laughs> it's hard to be in that, that place of indecision. Your text, or the, your, the Bible says that he said, go away. I'm waiting for a more convenient time. If you've been saved for any length of time and you had a true experience at an altar with an encounter with God at an altar, you'll, you'll agree with this that you couldn't understand why you waited so long Amen. Come on. for that moment. Come on. You put it off thinking it'd be more convenient at this church or more convenient at that church or this meeting over there or that meeting over there or maybe this all or maybe a particular speaker. It'll be more convenient then. There was an ad a number of years ago and it was a company that Tiger Woods repped, repped. <laughs> and, um, and it was fascinating. It was a fascinating sign and, and it featured this image. It had Tiger Woods on there and, and I assume everyone in here knows who that is. Okay. See, I got real quiet. I'm like, huh? 
the golfer. Um, Tiger Woods, and it featured, here's Tiger on this ad, and, and Tiger is, you know, arguably one of the greatest golfers of all time in, throughout his career as a whole. And there may be some that are better. There's certainly none better than his early years, I can tell you that. But he's also one of the wealthiest athletes in the world. If I, if I remember what I, I think, I don't know if I, yes, I did put it down. He's worth $1.2 billion today. That's 999,999,999 million, 999 plus one. That's one billion and then add another 200,000. That's a lot of money, man. He's a wealthy, he's a wealth, one of the wealthiest athletes. I believe, of course, Michael Jordan kind of eclipses him. I think he's worth nearly four billion, but everybody knows Michael Jordan's the best. If you're a LeBron person, get to this altar when we're done. <laughs> okay, we probably have to quit now. But his face at, in his prime, it wasn't unusual to see him on ads everywhere, commercials everywhere. Tiger Woods was a household name. He was marketed like the Messiah. He was everywhere. His face was on everything. And this particular advertisement uh, was for a company called Accenture. It was business consulting. Y'all may know this is one of his big sponsors. They actually had tournaments with this company. And it showed Tiger standing over this putt. And he's, you know, he's squatting down and, and he's shielding his face. And he's blocking out it, this rain. It was raining. It was raining hard in this, in this picture. And you could see that in the picture. And there's this caddy, and he had some sort of a squeegee, and he's trying to push the water out of the way and get it off the green. And if you've ever golfed before, you would, you would understand that's not prime golfing weather. No weather's prime for me if you've ever golfed with me. So uh, it's fun. And if you look at it other than a game, you'll be miserable with me. But his caddy is squeezing all that water away. He's trying to get it off the green. And, and it's just not prime conditions for golf. And the caption on this flyer or this advertisement said, waiting for ideal conditions is rarely an option. And that's what I want to tell, convey to you in the next few moments, preacher moments, is convey that to you about waiting for the right time, waiting for the ideal conditions. If you've been waiting for ideal conditions to make a step toward the Lord Jesus Christ or to do something in church or to do something in the Lord, you're playing a fool's game. There will never, ever, ever, ever in your humanity be ideal conditions. There will always be some reason that it's not time to commit now. There will always be some reason that this is not the service or this is not the church or the altar's not for me today. There'll always be a reason that crops up. We are factories of reasons. Don't worry, I'm gonna transition to excuses in a minute. We have them for everything. There will always be some reason that this is not the service. There'll always be some reason that I'm not the preacher or this isn't the church. There'll always be some reason why you don't make a move or a commitment toward God. There'll always be a reason that today is not the best day to crucify your flesh. Today is not the best day to subjugate your desires and to mortify the, your members and to surrender your will. Today is not the day for me to give my will to you. There'll always be a reason. See, the lie of the enemy is that tomorrow will be a better option. It's always fascinating me how people, not just young people, I spent a lot of time in youth ministry, but, but I remember young people saying, but I know now that pastoring, older people say it. They always feel like there's a better time some other time. I've got some more things I want to get done before I do that. I was always fascinated that young people would say, I want to go sow my wild oats. Stupidest statement in the world. That means I want to go create a bunch of emotional disasters in my life and have to go to an altar and weep and hope I can get over it. Okay, so young people hear that if you don't hear anything else. 
It's always fascinating to me that, that young people would say that, but it's even, it mortifies me when an older person says it. When I, I see the young people go, I'm going to go, I just want to go see what that party's like. Brilliant idea. Yeah. A lot of other 15, 16, 17, 18 year olds making a lot of good decisions. Going to be there with you. Oh, I know all of y'all were brilliant at 15, 16 years old. Not everybody was. See, the lie of the enemy is, says there's a better option and it's, it's tomorrow. There's always tomorrow or there's always more time later on. What, what is that song by Garth Brooks? If tomorrow never comes. I messed it up. Did somebody just play that music? <laughs> is Alexa in the room? <laughs> Y'all heard it. I know you did. What if tomorrow never comes? Then what? Of course, he's talking about how much he loved his, his wife or woman or whatever it was in that song. But what if tomorrow never comes that you're able to do it? What if that option's not available? There's always a tomorrow, preacher. There's always time later on. Next week's a better choice. Next Sunday would be better than this Sunday. Because Wednesday's out. We don't do Wednesday. That's just for freak shows. <laughs> That's for them hardcore Christians, man. Them Bible thumpers. What, what if tomorrow doesn't work? What if next week's not a better choice? Well, maybe, maybe next year, maybe next month. There's always a reason. Maybe after I'm done with my schooling, I can get it done. Maybe after I've had a successful marriage or get my, my wife, and then I can get that done. Maybe after I go through all my teens and try everything, maybe after I try a few jobs or get my career in line, then I can make that choice. Maybe after, after retirement, after I've lived it up and poured into me and all this self, self, self stuff, maybe then is a more convenient time. But the simple fact is that each day has its own fresh supply of excuses. How many parents in the room? Okay, y'all are scared. What if that's not a hard question. <laughs> right? Do your kids have a fresh supply of excuses about cleaning their room? <laughs> about picking up something? Why you didn't? There's always an excuse. They call it a reason, but let's face it, y'all. We really don't have a lot of good reasons. We have a lot of good excuses. Good reason is I chopped my foot off and I was in the emergency room. That's a good reason why you didn't make it somewhere. But because you're tired and you want your carcass to sit there in a lazy boy watching television, that's not a good reason. Binging on Netflix is not a good reason. That's an excuse. That, was that a mischievous look? I tried to get it. I don't know if I got it or not. You can't normally tell because I got so many chins, but I tried to do it. That's not a good reason. That's simply an excuse, and we have a fresh supply of them every single day. Sometimes our excuses almost outweigh his mercy. There's a fresh supply. Each season of life has its own brand of delay. Each chapter of your story has some reason that you'd be better served to postpone your decision. But this ad, this ad was moving. This ad was convicting and challenging this ad that I told you about, was, was, it was very moving. And I believe, I believe even God had something to say. I believe even God would, would speak this voice through the ad. And he would say, tell them that waiting for ideal conditions is not an option. Tell them that this is the day that I have made. Tell them that this is the day of their salvation. Tell them that this is the service I've designed for them. Tell them that that altar call was specifically crafted for them. Let me tell you what waiting is. Waiting is, is tantamount to failure. Paul 
has been arrested. The Jews had him and then rescued him from their hands by the Romans or, or the Jews had arrested him and then he was rescued by the Romans. Had it not been for their intervention, Paul would have already been tried and convicted under this corrupt system the Jews had in place. The Roman authorities had delivered him to the governor. The governor's name in our reading is Felix. And he holds him for five days until his accusers can be gathered together. And then here's the case against Paul. And Paul presents his defense and says, but this I confess to you, that after the way which they call heresy, so worship I the God of my fathers. At the end of Paul's defense, Felix decides he needs to hear from the Roman chief captain who had actually taken Paul into custody. So until he can bring that man down, he commands Paul to the care of the centurion. During that time, Felix and his wife Drusilla call for Paul to come and explain his faith to them. They wanted to know more. Something got them in their heart and they wanted to hear more about this Jesus. And he reasoned of righteousness, the Bible says, temperance and judgment to come. This, these are the things he was talking about. And when Paul was done, they were so moved, the Bible says that they trembled. Maybe we should pause long enough to point out that there's a difference between being moved and moving. A lot of you were moved a moment ago, but you didn't move. In spite of all of this, the Bible says he was trembling, but he made no move toward God. He pushed his motions aside, and in spite of his emotions, there was no response of the will. Nothing in him really changed Nothing compelled him to do anything differently. A lot of us keep going through the motions and coming to church on Sundays and going home acting as if that's the paramount of our existence with the Lord Jesus Christ. We've done our duty, now we can go and we go through the same motions over and over and over again. Some have been in church so long, some came up like I did and they had the revelation of the infilling of the Holy Spirit by evidence in tongues. They experienced it once and that's it. And some grew up in other places where maybe that wasn't taught or given to them or revealed to them and they resist it because it wasn't given to them or revealed to them. Nothing changed and he didn't move. Nothing about the experience affected him when Paul was returned to his cell. Once the service was over, once the sermon was a memory, once the notes of the songs that we sang had drifted from his mind, then he went back to exactly what he was. I've seen, I don't know how many people in my lifetime as a preacher moved, moved in dramatic fashion. I've seen them tremble. I've seen tears running down their face. I've watched them. But when the emotion of the moment was done, there had been no substantive change in their lives and they never moved. They were just moved. You think about these stories and you, or you look at these and, and these are actual events and what was it that kept Felix from making a change in his life? What could it possibly be that would keep us from a commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ? It's offering hope and faith. It's offering life and joy. Not just life, but life and that more abundantly. It's offering an eternity in paradise with Jesus Christ. Man, it's awesome. Why would we delay? Ooh, the flesh is strong. Our will's the only thing stronger than his. You know what he wants you to do, so it's your will that has to decide. Submit or not submit, that's the question. Shakespeare had it all wrong. 
Why didn't he repent immediately? Why wouldn't he and his wife go and submit and repent immediately? Why was there no immediate response to the tug of the Holy Spirit? Why not fall from his throne and say to Paul, I need to meet this Jesus today. I need him more than anything. Well, I can't answer those questions except for what the scripture tells us. But one thing I know, somewhere in Felix's tortured reasoning was the thought that whatever was holding him back would possibly not be there on some future day. If I just make it through and don't submit now, maybe when I get home, this feeling will subside and I won't have to address it. A lot of people run from this. I told you a moment ago, we, those of us have been saved for a while, when we came, we wondered, why did I wait so long? Amen. It begins in an altar of repentance, but then there's so much more. Amen. Why did I wait so long to do that? It was beautiful. It's like somebody took an 800-pound gorilla off me. Maybe some future day I won't be feeling those things. Maybe if this preacher will hurry, I can get to the buffet and eat it away. For even while his hands were shaking and tears were in his eyes, even while conviction created a moment of an eternal shift, he spoke some of the saddest words found in all of your Bible. Go your way for now. When I have a more convenient time or season, I'll call for you. How sad. God opened the doors wide up. Come in. It's okay. But something in me, that flesh in me, fights against it. I've had all I need for today. I didn't want to change. I just wanted to feel something. I just wanted to come to church and feel some goosebumps and leave. I didn't want any commitment involved. No consecration, no submitting, no obedience. Those are cuss words in America. Why did I, I just want the feeling. What do you do when the feeling subsides? Who do you lean to? I just wanted to feel something. Go ahead. I don't need any more than I have right now. I just need that. I'm good for today. I've pacified my conscience for now. I've got enough to keep me happy for a second. I think I can ignore, ignore God's calling. I can ignore his voice for the next few days until the next time conviction falls. When things are different, I'll call for you, preacher. When things get better, when things aren't so bad or when things are so good, when all these reasons and excuses we have, when I'll call then, preacher, how many times have I gone to a house where marriage was falling apart, but had they had just come? Had they had just made the Lord Jesus the Lord of their home? Amen. Y'all aren't with me. How many times have I gone to a room and prayed for somebody and said, God, in my heart, I might not profess it out loud, God, I'm praying for this poor soul. Amen. I want you to raise them up and give them one more chance. Come on. When things are different, I'll call for you. If it's convenient, I'll call. In a more convenient time, I'll really give my life to Jesus Christ. See, you want a profession only but no relationship. You want to put Baptist or Pentecostal or Church of Christ or, or apostolic or whatever it is over your door and say, that's what I am, but my life doesn't reflect that. The sign is false advertising. Now is the wrong time. Now is not easy. I wish the preacher would quit. I'm going through some stuff right now. I don't need to talk about this. I don't want to give up anything. I don't want to stop anything. I don't want to submit anything. I don't want to sacrifice anything. I've had enough. I've got some issues right now. I'm trying to sort some things out. When I get it all sorted out, have you ever found out you don't ever get it all sorted out? Does anybody know what I'm talking about yet? When I get it all figured out, 
When you get that done, you'll be the richest person in the world. Because ain't nobody got it all figured out. When I get that done, then maybe then, this just isn't a good time. This is not the right season. The timing is wrong. I don't want it now. I'm too immature on a Sunday morning. I'm too preoccupied at 20 years old. I'm too broke at 30. I'm too busy at 40. I'm too distracted at 50. I'm too tired at 60. I'm too old in my 70s. And by my 80s, big deal. Until at some point the excuses blur into a life lived without a significant altered moment. I'm compelled to ask you today, all that are sitting in here, any that's watching, why and what are you waiting on? What is it? What's the reason? What's the excuse? What's the reason why you don't want to live a life for Jesus Christ? What's the reason why you don't want to be saved? What's the reason why you don't want to recommit? What's the reason why you don't want to be rebaptized? What's the reason why you don't want to start fresh and new today? Today's a brand new day. The door's open. Ideal conditions never come. Every day has its own distractions. Every day has its own excuses. Every day has its own reasons not to let that be the day that you give your all to the Lord Jesus. Matthew 6, 34 says this statement, sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Ooh, I want to preach right there. I tried my face again. Every day has its own problems. Every day, according to scripture, has its own evil. Every day has something that's going to pull you away from Jesus on your job, in your school, in your family. Every day is going to say, don't give anymore. Don't go there anymore. Don't give your talent, your time, your treasure. Don't do that anymore, pulling me away. Has anybody ever experienced that? I can't tell you how many times we've been asked, man, all y'all do is church. When the reality is there's 168 hours in a week and we're here, my wife and I, being the pastors of the church, we, we're here maybe six to eight. Pastor Nick, same, about eight or 10, maybe more than that. He's comes up here and he hides in that office up there. But if y'all ever come here and you don't hear him, he's up there, just go up there and scare him. (laughs) Every day has its own. If you allow it, one day will blur into the next day and into another and into another and into another and into another. Then it's a week and into another week and then into a month, then into a year and then into a lifetime. Some of you heard stuff like this 40 years ago and you still woke up with excuses the next day. Amen. If you allow it, this is, that's what will happen. One missed altar, one missed altar call blurs into another missed altar call that blurs into a pattern of missed altar calls, that blurs into a life of missed altar calls. And all through the process comes the echo of the man named Felix, not right now. If I were just older, if I were just younger, if my job would just straighten out, if I had all the money I needed, if my home life were better, if my husband or my wife would act a little differently, if my background weren't so troubled, if I couldn't, if I get all my bills under control, if my kids would get their things all together and quit losing their mind, if I weren't so tired, if I just felt better, if there's just a more convenient season, I'll do it. We're a basket full of excuses. Come on. Anybody, come on, anybody, any procrastinators in the room? Come on, you make all kind of excuses why you'll do it tomorrow. Yep. Well, I'll fold that laundry tomorrow. I've been to your house, you're lying. <laughs> that basket's still sitting there. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> huh? You know that toilet needs a new, a new valve in it and you ain't put it in there yet. I'll just live with that leak. A little drip, it won't bother me long. I'll fix it tomorrow. If tomorrow never comes, y'all gonna look up Garth Brooks now. I've got a honeydew list a mile long. Why? I could complete it probably in a week. I've had 30 years to do it, Jim. 
<laughs> All the wives just got in there. Yeah, preach that. Start shaking their hand right there, right there, right there, right there. <laughs> tomorrow never comes. Never seems to be tomorrow. You notice that? I'm going to do better tomorrow. I'm going to get my budget in line tomorrow. I'm starting a new budget next week. I'm going to write everything down, what I expend. I'm going to know where everything goes. Hmm? I'm going to, I'm going to hang on to every receipt. I'm going to log every dime. I'm going to know because I got a new budget tomorrow. If tomorrow, do I need to sing it again? I'm going to start tomorrow being a good person. I'm going to start tomorrow not lying. I'm going to start tomorrow not cheating. I'm going to start tomorrow Where's tomorrow? Some mythical place in the future that you may never see. Yeah, come on. You're not guaranteed tomorrow, neither am I. I don't know. Look at me, man. I'm morbidly obese. I have no idea. You're not supposed to say come on on that. I love him. <laughs> what about them? One man said it like this, if you wait until you have enough money to have children, the race would die out in one generation. I hear people say that all the time. Well, we're not going to have kids right now. We're going to build up whatever. <laughs> I don't think I've ever seen one success story there. There may be some, but most of them aren't. If I have enough money and get that all in line, I tell you that if you wait until everything is perfect before you really sell out to the Lord Jesus Christ. Your soul will die in one lifetime. Come on. If you wait until all of life is conducive to repentance, you'll go on with unrepentant sin for a lifetime. If you delay until your environment is right and all the signs are in place and all the planets are aligned, you'll never take the steps you need to take to get your soul right with God. Pastor Nick, come on. I hope, or let me say it this way, I sincerely believe that at that moment, Felix intended to respond. He intended to respond what he felt someday. I believe that. Someday in his mind, he thought someday would come. And that he would. But the delaying tactic of the enemy allowed other hungers to well up in him. Acts 24, 26, he hoped also that money should have been given him of Paul that he might loose him. Wherefore, he sent for him and communed with him. You see, in short order, he learned to handle these visits with Paul. No more trembling, no more tears, no more conviction. Some of us have been in church services so long and sat in pews so many times for hours in our lifetime that conviction is foreign. Come on. We've learned to build a wall and not allow ourselves to feel. We've learned to pull things up and to hold back tears. Oh, I watched some folks over the years, they get the backs of them chairs and we used to have pews and they, their knuckles would be just white because that's what's holding them there. <laughs> I'm not going. I'm not submitting. I'm not committing. We don't, we don't get any glory for you giving your life to Jesus. I'll do it later. But see, we've got ourselves conditioned now where nothing's going to move us. Just an attitude of what can I get out of this? Doesn't take all that long at delaying until we get good at just handling church. I'll say it again. Doesn't take very long until you're real good at handling me or other preachers that get here. Altar calls don't bother you anymore. Preaching rarely challenges or moves you. You ever, I'm not saying you, this is in general, right? We say this big you that goes outside these walls. 
The Spirit of God doesn't convict us like it used to. No, we get comfortable with what used to disquiet us. We can handle church of any stripe or color now. Any word from anybody will work for me. Shouting or weeping, we, we know how to fit in now. We know to put the mask on and blend. And soon, we come only for what we can get. How will God bless me today? How will God give to me today? What's God going to do for me today? What can I get from the experience today? And all the while, the voice of God is saying, this is a day that I would like to give you something. This is a day that I would like not so much to work for you, but to work on you and to work in you and to work through you. How long has it been since you gave yourself with reckless abandon into an altar moment? When was the last time you came to an altar saint, not just sinner, saint of God, and you just with reckless abandon threw your hands in the air and you didn't care what anybody thought? You say, God, I need you more than I need this. When was the last time that you did that? How long has it been since tears poured down your face because conviction was tight and gripped around your heart? How long has it been since you realized that the word of God was speaking directly to you at that very moment? And all your excuses and all your delays and all your not nows melted from your heart. I believe today is that moment. I believe now is that time. I'm talking or preaching to Felix's today and Drusilla's today. I'm talking to you. I'm preaching to someone who knows deep inside that church has become a habit instead of your lifeline. I'm preaching that ideal conditions do not exist. Today is the day of your salvation and now is the accepted time and now is the time that Jesus is calling you. And lastly, my heart is screaming out right now because time is our most limited commodity. That's it. Because as much as we'd like to ignore the fact, time is not limitless. It's not a resource that we'll always have. None of us have an unending progression of tomorrows to depend on. Tomorrows are an illusion created by the expectations we are so casual or we so casually enjoy. We turn today into a party of self-indulgence, of self-pity and self-absorption. And the excuse that is repeated throughout the party is in a convenient season, season, preacher, we will change. But the voice of scripture comes crashing into your party. The psalmist would say, so teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. The the apostle James would say, whereas you know not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? It's just a vapor or a puff of smoke. It appears just for a short time and then it vanishes away. Will you stand? I can't tell you how many more church services you'll have or I'll have. I can't tell you how many more church services anyone would have. I can't tell you how many more altar calls you'll be allowed to respond to or ignore. But I can tell you that the one whose name is true, the one whose name is faithful, who has never lied, whose words are forever settled in heaven, closed his book with his final words being, Behold, I come quickly. The sounding of the trumpets will forever seal that deal.
Tomorrows are not guaranteed. Tomorrows are simply an excuse to ignore today. Ideal conditions don't exist. Frankly, ideal conditions are a lie. But there's a weight that's heavy today in me. It's weighing me down. It's to say, get right now. Get on track today. Repent today. Commit today. Submit today. Consecrate today. Build an altar today. Die out to self today. Today is the day of your salvation. Time is rushing toward the conclusion of all things. Suddenly things come into focus. There's no waiting for another season. All the seasons are nearly completed. This precious commodity we call time is going to vanish one day. Felix, you're just about out of chances. Now listen, don't walk away from me and think I'm just talking to to unsaved folk. This is for us too. This was in my mirror. It's just about Felix. No matter what you've been waiting on, it doesn't warrant or merit another delay. If you're looking for convenience, all I can tell you is this. Today is your day. If you're looking for a convenient time, it's now. If you're a Christian today, if you're not a Christian today, if you want to make your calling and election sure and say, Jesus, I want to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that I'm heaven bound. I want you to come. And Christians, especially spirit-filled Christians, if you've not been baptized and rebaptized in the Holy Spirit, today's your day. If you want to recommit your life, today's your day. There's not a more convenient time. That's the altar call. The altar's open. Who will be? Who will submit? Who will come? Who's ready? There's no more convenient time than now. Now's it.